recently, Webcourses Bangkok had the opportunity to talk with Julian Smith, author, influential blogger, podcaster extraordinaire, and all-round nice guy. So Julian, for those who haven't been keeping up with your career, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I guess about myself, my my name is Julian Smith. Uh, I'm best known as the uh, co-author of the best-selling uh, Trust Agents, which is about social media and uh, how to develop an audience and things like that. And the study of what people do on the web that makes them successful. It's kind of a seven habits of highly effective people for the internet. And uh, so that book has done very well. Uh, I've been on the web for many years. I was heavily involved in early podcasting efforts back in the day in 2004. And I was one of the only professional podcasters that ever kind of existed during the brief period where people made a living doing that. And I uh, am working on another book with Chris Brogan. I do a ton of talks uh, based on the social web and the understanding of of uh, what happens to society and what happens to culture and how businesses are influenced by it. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Anyway, so I just I do a bunch of stuff. Increasingly, more and more, uh, I just I have the chance to pick my projects, so it's really nice. I'm working on a really big kind of like ebook thing right now. Uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a lot of writing, so it's pretty interesting. I didn't think that I would become this person. I don't have a background in it at all. I never graduated from university. Uh, there was a good percentage chance that I was going to become a janitor instead. But I mean, m- maybe in the future, I might become one. Who knows? Yeah, so I kind of narrowly avoided that, and it still instead ended up on the web working on uh, cool internet stuff. You mentioned the book you wrote along with Chris Brogan. Can you tell us, what was your inspiration to write it? Uh, well... So we've been we've been on this in this space forever. We've been in the social web for a really long time, and it's uh, we started doing pod camps way back in the day, like in two thousand five. And uh, it was immediately obvious to us that some people were like getting ahead and were able to build you know huge audiences, or they were able to de- develop like vast networks of people. And the fact that they were able to do this on the internet meant that they were able to do it without even meeting people, really. And so we started, Chris and I started doing talks about the quote-unquote trust economy back in the day, how to get inside the circle, what being inside the circle means. And so we did these talks for like, I don't know, probably six months to a year. They led to a, an ebook that we did with Change This, which almost got lost in the shuffle. And if it had, uh, we, there never would have been a book. Instantly, there were responses from publishers Uh, We signed a deal and worked on that for about a year and a half. In the book, you mention how success happens for some and not for others. What are the key factors behind that online success? The biggest factors behind uh, people's success on the web is, number one, their ability to understand systems, and two, their ability to understand people. So uh, understanding people means understanding both individuals and how people behave, uh, the ability kind of to be out of yourself and understand when you're talking, when you're doing certain things, if you have a relationship with somebody, what is that relationship about? Uh, how is it bad? How is it not working? How is it working? That's like individual relationships, you know, things from going from body posture to uh, tone of voice to confidence. And then on the network level, which is kind of a bigger level, understanding how networks function and how ideas get passed through that. And then so the second aspect of it is an understanding of systems, which is what the web is. The web is a giant, you know, sort of network. And and if you understand what, how the levers work behind the web, you have this huge advantage and you can, can leverage a ton, a ton of effort. And I know that people kind of use that as, as a buzzword. But the reality is, is that uh, if you are not using it, then it's like you're reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And people that have read the book now have a greater understanding of it than they did. And I'm really grateful for that because I feel like people are really, uh, as they say in French, uh, ils sont en train de tourner, mettre des bâtons dans les roues. So what they mean is uh, you're putting the, the sticks in, in the wheels, like they're stopping themselves cold. Social marketing has turned into something of a social mania recently. Where do you see the industry going in, say, the next five years or so? Every object will have a Twitter page or a Twitter feed. Uh, it's starting already with location-based services. You could see that right now. So in my curtains well, may not have a Twitter account, but they do have status updates, which essentially the status update is the core of the social web in a way. So uh, status updates for locations means 
what is a special right now uh, to what people are currently in this place to whether the bathroom is currently uh, is currently occupied or or free, and so that is the essence of the social web is being able to look over at a clock and see what the time is. That is a status update. And so when you take all of these things and everything that I look at right now, for example, my you know I'm looking out the window. I see that it's a sunny day. This is a status update. It's uh, access to information directly. Uh, through non uh, outside of the five senses, so basically we're looking at a web which is in every place which with which you have access to any piece of information that you would if you were actually in the location, but you don't you aren't actually there. So basically, all we're doing is we're um, reducing friction. A location is friction. Uh, you know, uh, money is friction, all of these things and, and all of these uh, hierarchies that are being flattened. So it kind of goes back to what they said uh, in, in Clue Train Manifesto, which is hyperlinks flatten hierarchies. Well, this, and so it, it flattens informational hierarchies and the social web flattens social hierarchies. There seems to be a new company like Foursquare or Gualia opening up every other day. What do you think is happening with the location-based uh, I retweeted out an old blog post that I wrote a while ago now that was all about uh, what s- successful social software does. And uh, all that successful social software does is it facilitates an existing human behavior. So uh, plentyoffish.com is the most famous um, the most famous uh, website for free dating or whatever, right? So if I go to plentyoffish.com, it's the ugliest website in the world. It's super ugly, like ridiculously ugly. 116,000 people are online right at this moment. Um, and they, you know, search for dates or for hookups or whatever. This is a natural human behavior. And all we're doing, as I mentioned before, is uh, we are facilitating it and reducing friction. So we're reducing geography problems. We're reducing time problems where I and you, you, you know, you and I are not dating. I'm, I'm not available. Uh, are, where you and I have to be in the same place at the same time. And all of these other things, which are frictions... Uh, between you and, in a way, almost like your ideal self, your ideal self, which can check if the oven is still on, you know, at home without actually, or if your door is locked or things like that. So all successful uh, behavior, sorry, all successful social software is based on existing behavior. So location base is obvious because it's something natural and it works. It, it does kind of a recommendation engine at the same time. So I, I, I find my life better improved by... Uh, by things like location software, specifically Foursquare. I do not use Guala, and I never have. Um, and I found it makes my life better in an actual significant way where Twitter did not do that for a very long time, where Facebook did not do that for a very long time, where blogs did not do that for a very long time. But where it comes to location-based software, I can, I can land in an airport. It doesn't matter where the airport is, anywhere in America. And I can just tweet, not tweet out, but I send a status update as to my location, which is I'm in Chicago or something. And I will get like five messages on Twitter saying, hey, how long are you in town? Do you want to hang out? This is a significant, real way that my life has been improved. Also, in my own neighborhood, let's, I just moved into a, I just bought a place like maybe nine months ago or a year ago. So I'm in a neighborhood which I've never lived in before. But through Foursquare, I encounter people that are in this neighborhood a lot. And so we have real relationships and we do meet up eventually and we learn about each other and about the neighborhood as a result. So we become almost like better citizens and more connected people by doing this. And Twitter, in a sense, is like very people very far away. So you can still have relationships, but it's not entirely, it's not visceral like face-to-face is. And so that's another aspect of it is the ability to connect with people in real life and have a real, a tighter relationship in a faster way because you're connecting with them. So how do you think that small business can harness the power of this social media? So when I look at this, it, I, I, I have this obsession with starting a barbershop, okay, which may or may not you know, actually fulfill itself in any way. But uh, a barbershop is a perfect example of a, of a social object, which is a phrase that's been coined by Hugh uh, McLeod of gapingvoid.com. The idea that anything 
whether it's an idea or a location or anything, a piece of art, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, all of that is facilitated by a social object. A conversation occurs around a social object. That's why it's much easier for two guys to get together, let's say, I don't know, fire up the barbecue and cook a couple of steaks than just to sit there across the table from each other and just talk for like a couple hours. You feel me? So... Uh, so because of the social object, everything is facilitated. So the job of the business is the same job that it always has been before, which is to say to become a pillar of your community before you become uh, almost like a business person. You may start your business, that's fine, but the real way that you actually become a part of a community is by inter- interacting with people on a human level. So Google, just to give you an example of this, because this is a huge brand, but it could apply just as easily to, to local things. Google, during the World Cup, put in a Vuvuzela button on every YouTube video. And I don't know if, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you can, you can Google it if you want. It's, it, was, it was a little icon that looked like a soccer ball. And if you clicked on it, it would literally just start the Vuvuzela sound. And no matter how low you, you, you put the volume, the volume of the video would go down but the volume of the vuvuzelas would not go down. So, like, they can turn this thing on and off. And so what this is, is it is, okay, so number one, it is fruitless. There is no profit potential in this, in the traditional sense. It is a waste of resources, okay, literally. It is, it is risky because it's something that, that it impacts, you know, possibly tens of millions of people within a period of one month. And it is funny at least to some people, or maybe annoying to some people. All of those things which I just described are human behaviors, not company behaviors. And so the job of Google in this specific circumstance is to act as if they were human. Even if they're not, you're putting out certain signals and you're setting up certain things in order to profit. And then you have to set up other things in order to appear human. And I literally mean like like a fucking cyborg. Because as long as a cyborg is able to act human, then it will be treated as a human being. But as soon as there's a lack of congruence between behaviors and then someone is like, wait, hold on. No human being would ever respond in that way. The, the illusion, quote unquote, is shattered. And, and all of a sudden, they're put into a different social category that of non-entity, and we can treat you any way they want. The reason that people in, uh, in business uh, will go to a Best Buy, for example, which is a very famous American electronics store, and they will uh, they'll walk in there, you know, they'll buy a, uh, I don't know, a Nintendo Wii. They'll take it, they'll bring it home, they'll play it for a couple of days, they'll return it, and then a day later, after it's returned, they'll come and buy the same Nintendo, but from the refurb bin. And that refurb's been it costs it costs twenty five percent less in order to which so you can you can literally just buy the buy the Nintendo return it and then the next day you could show up and you could buy the same Nintendo for twenty five percent off okay so people do this and the reason that they do it is because of a lack of congruence between human behavior and company behavior they would never do this to a friend of theirs they only do it to companies because companies are not people and so. The trick with a company, if you want to be part of a community, you want to get all the advantages of what being in a community means, is to act as if you are human. And sometimes that means making sacrifices. Uh, but the point is, is it is a human, not a company behavior. And if they're able to total, kind of be in between those two well enough, you can still be very profitable and you can take advantage of the community aspects of the social web and you'll end up in a really good spot.